since about 2017, 2018. Um, when the ICO bubble came out, I started coding on Ethereum. Um, I won ETH Denver 2021 um, with my team. Uh, we built a anti-hack software and we ended up making that into a startup and into a company. So I left Duke to start that company, follow my you know, startup dream of college. So still living the dream, hope to keep living the dream. Um, we raised around four and a half million dollars from Dragonfly, Coinbase Ventures, OpenSea to build um, one of the top security tools out there for consumers right now. Um, but I won't really get into that during this presentation. It's mostly just going to be educational. And my claim to fame is that me and my brother, who's also my co-founder, debated Vitalik on stage at ETH Denver 2021, 22. I forget, but we were up there. That's our picture. Um, I post that everywhere. So um, let's just get into it. So for most people, security is a state of mind and not a state of being. So what does that really mean? Uh, when, when I talk about security and when security professionals talk about security, it's usually pretty discreet, it's measurable. Um, you'll go through a checklist and you'll see like, am I immune to this? Okay, check. Um, am I vulnerable to this? Okay, check. But for most people, that's not the way that we think about it. Uh, the way that we think about it is, you know, do I feel secure? Does the marketing language that the companies that are selling to me make me feel happy and wholesome? Um, do the pictures that they're using have smiling people that look secure? Um, and ultimately, you know, it's not a discrete measurement, it's more like a vibe check feeling that people have. So the goal of my presentation is to kind of, you know, break that dynamic, make security a more measurable and discrete thing for you, um, and essentially give you a quick, easy checklist of three points to say, am I secure or am I vulnerable? And just go from there. So I would say the biggest feeling when it comes to, you know, how secure am I? How am I feeling about security? Most people think, you know, I'm not going to be the next person to be attacked by a hacker, by a scammer. The protocols that I'm using aren't going to be the next ones that get attacked by um, high-funded hackers. Uh, essentially, it ain't going to be me. And that kind of causes a lot of issues. That's a big reason why that whole kind of vibe check of do I feel secure versus am I actually secure comes from. That's where the kind of paradigm shift occurs. And I just want to get into, you know, who are we kind of fighting against as end users? Who are the people that are actually trying to steal your crypto? Um, and I want to paint them in a way that, that kind of visualizes the threat versus the stereotypes that we kind of see. So most people assume that crypto scammers and just scammers in general are just like in this weird call center um, or like in a sweatshop in the developing world they're calling everybody, messaging everybody, making bots. Uh, and to be honest with you, that couldn't be further from the truth. The truth is that the entire economy that causes wallets to be drained, protocols to be hacked, um, causes this over, I think over a trillion at this point, um, crypto theft issue is because of an economy that starts from the developed world with big bankrollers um, and moves across the world. How does that system work? Um, there's three pieces, just like any company. There's investors, there's managers, and then there's developers. So these bankrollers are spending hundreds of millions to tens of millions on projects um, where team leads are hiring developers to attack certain protocols, attack end users. Uh, so it's in their benefit to make themselves seem like this you know, call center in the developing world. But what they actually are are corporations built to steal your money. Uh, and the reason I kind of stress that point is because it, back to like the, the original point of security being this kind of mindset for most people instead of something concrete, this illusion that hackers are, are not educated, are not smart, are not good enough to take your money, that's a big reason why people feel secure but are not actually secure. So moving from there, how, I, I guess like the big question is probably how do you know if you're safe? There's a lot of conflicting security advice out there. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of panels or a lot of talks here talking about, you know, here are the top 10 security tips for, you know, MetaMask users or whatever. This is not going to be that kind of talk. I want to create a way to definitively measure your wallet security um, and actually, you know, give yourself an honest perspective. Like, am I secure or not? How can I be attacked? Where can I be attacked? Et cetera. So here are the three categories. There's private key security, there's transaction security, 
and then there's actions, uh, access management. And I'll be going a bit in depth onto each of these. So just giving a quick summary, private key, how do you, steal your key, how do you store your keys, transactions, how open are you to phishing attacks, and access management, how many people have infinite access to your crypto, um, which is something that happens in crypto, so getting into it. For most people, the security journey stops at private keys, um, stops at hardware wallets. So the, and I, I respect these companies a lot, companies like Trezor, Ledger, KeepKey, uh, but it's, it's, and I don't think their marketing is misleading in any way. I think customers are frequently misled to believe that a hardware wallet is the end all be all for their wallet security. And I think that's just uh, perpetuated by just kind of a community myth. Uh, in reality, private keys, I would say are about, like private key security is about five to 10% of an entire wallet security. So what is private key security? It's making sure that your, the access to your wallet, the master access to your wallet is not stored on like Google Drive. I, I know there's some people in the audience right now that, that might be exposed right now, but Google Drive, Screenshots, I know screenshots are a big thing. The Notes app, uh, those are all really awful because those are stored in the cloud. Um, they, people might have access to it through other means other than, um, you know, a lot of other means. When you store your wallet and your recovery keys on paper or in a hardware wallet, um, it makes it a lot more harder to get that master access to your wallet. People would have to, you know, do the, the path of getting a private key from someone that owns a hardware wallet is a lot more difficult than other methods of theft. So as long as you have a private key, you should be, um, you know, that's kind of the first step, but it's not where your security journey should end. I would say the biggest, um, there's two biggest portions, and that's the transaction and access management portion. So for transactions, it's, the, the, the key idea is, am I protected against phishing attacks? If, if I was to click a link um, and believe that it was something else, what am I liable to lose all of my crypto assets? So there's services and browsers that, that protect you from phishing attacks. Um, you know, Google Chrome, there's other companies like us that, that help with this. But for the most part, um, transaction security is kind of the most vague. It's, it's really hard because uh, you, you're never gonna know from, so I, I guess I can illustrate this point with a story. Um, one of my best friends, um, he's a developer. He's been developing on crypto longer than me. He's an OG Bitcoin dev from around 2014, 2015. And he fell victim to an NFT mint scam, which is like, for most people, that's kind of like an elementary level scam. But just because he's exposed to it constantly, he's always on crypto Twitter, he's always on Telegram, um, just a hit rate of one caused him to lose all of a certain asset in his wallet. Um, so is there a way to be truly protected against all phishing attacks? I would say yes, it's a combination of both separating your assets across multiple wallets and also using tools that make sure that you're not signing anything that you're not supposed to be. I finally wanna talk about access management. Uh, and the question here is, how many people have access to my crypto? How many, and when I talk about access to my crypto, it's, it's uh, a very strong term. And a lot of people don't realize that when you use a new app, like this, uh, this example image is talking about PancakeSwap, or if you're using Aave or OpenSea or, or any other marketplace or service, you are giving that company full access to all of that asset in your wallet. So that means that at any time, they can transfer the entire quantity of a certain token out of your wallet and into theirs. For the most part, a lot of companies use that power very safely. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll scratch that. Maybe about 25% of companies use that access very safely. 75% of them suck. Uh, they, they get audits that, that aren't useful. Um, and what happens is that when those smart contracts get hacked, when those protocols get hacked, all of the customers lose all of the money in their wallets. It's, it's awful. So when I talk about how many people have access to my crypto, um, reducing that amount is essential. And I want to talk about a specific case, and this is, this is something that really was popular um, last year, but it's still continuing now. If you guys have heard of the monkey drainer hack, um, this, is, this is similar. So gasless NFT theft, what does that mean? 
It means that people are losing all of the NFTs, all of the tokens in their wallet without even sending a transaction to the blockchain. And the question is, you know, how does that happen? Why, why are people losing money without even sending a transaction to the blockchain? And it's because um, NFT marketplaces like X2Y2, OpenSea, Blur, what they're doing is they have full access to your tokens, of course, because they're letting you buy and sell tokens. But there's this weird feature on these exchanges that lets you sign a signature, like a login signature if you're familiar. If you've ever used the Web3 protocol, it's like that gasless signature. By using a gasless signature, you can sell all of your assets to another person in a private auction for zero ETH. Meaning that if you sign that, if you sign that gasless signature, you've just given somebody else access to your entire wallet balance for zero ETH. They can buy it off of OpenSea or they can buy it off of X2Y2. This is one thing that gets solved super easily by just revoking that NFT marketplace access to your assets. So um, what, we, what I've done for a lot of people is I kind of go through their wallet and see you know, what protocols have access to your crypto. And if you've been using crypto since like 2017, 2018, it's probably around 50 to 75 protocols have access to your tokens. If any of those guys get hacked, you're done. You're, you're losing all of your money. Um, so I would say that when it comes to the ranking of importance of actual security in crypto, I would rate hardware wallets and just like private key security at the bottom. And when it comes to scams and access, um, access management, I would put those on top. Um, and I just want to go into kind of, you know, the, the logic of an attacker and why these routes are, are the most like lucrative. So if, if I'm a hacker and I'm trying to steal people's money, I'm not going to, it, it's the hardest route for me to try to steal someone's private key. At this point, people know not to put their private key in like a website or anything like that. It's way easier for me to just get you to sign a gasless signature on, on uh, some NFT marketplace and sell all your assets to me. It's so easy and it's mass producible. And that's why these last two points of kind of um, transaction security and action ac access management are the most important to me. So um, I guess when it comes to actually solving those problems, just going back to my slides, for private keys, get a hardware wallet. Even though I kind of talk trash about them, I have one. I have every wallet that I have is a hardware wallet. You need one. Even if it's 10%, you need one. And get your private keys off of your notes app, please. And if you actually did put your notes app private key, maybe make a new wallet. Uh, for transaction security, make sure that it, it, do, it doesn't matter what service you use to um, prevent phishing, um, but your eye is not the only one. Like, your eye is not trained enough to track every single phishing scam out there. So please just use a service that's out there. There's plenty of them. And finally, access management. Make sure that you're revoking your approvals as soon as you put them in. Um, there's a cool website called revoke.cash. I should have put the logo in my, in my slides. Um, you put your address in, and you can just remove all access from every company, uh, all companies' access to your crypto. So I guess that's kind of the end of my presentation. I know I, I talk kind of fast. I want to leave the floor open to any questions. Um, I don't want to hammer on these points too hard. Yeah, go ahead. So the question was, um, so there's a new kind of paradigm in wallets where they're giving you the ability to define how much of a certain asset you're giving to a certain protocol. So for example, I have, uh, well, I wish I had 100,000 USDC, but imagine I had 100,000 USDC. Um, and then I gave Uniswap access to 10,000. That means that they're only able to access 10,000 and the rest of it, and once that 10,000 is kind of used up, they don't have access anymore. It's more common, but it's not, it's getting more common, but I would say it's like a 10% thing. Um, and I would say even then, even if all of your approvals are limited, uh, there's specific edge cases that cause these um, approvals to kind of linger. And that's with NFTs. NFTs, they're never gonna ask you to approve each NFT individually. 
when you use an NFT marketplace or when you're trading NFTs, you are giving access to every NFT you own or ever will own of that specific type to a company. And they're never going to ask you to do it one by one because it's an awful UX process. So I would still recommend going through and you know, revoking those approvals because not every one of them can be limited. Cool. And I guess uh, with that, uh, uh, any more questions? Oh, go ahead. One Cosmos? We're expanding to layer twos and the side chains um, in Q2. So um, I, I know we didn't talk about it right now, but um, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders at Harpy. We stop people from sending money to scammers and fishers by essentially sitting between their wallet and the blockchain. The question is, well, right now we work on Ethereum. The question is when Cosmos, Cosmos Q2. So March, um, anywhere from April to, April to June. I think delegates are super important. So, the, so for people that are not aware about, uh, so the question is, what do I think about delegates? And for people that are not aware about delegates, um, it's kind of like a way to prove your ownership of a certain asset without actually connecting the wallet that owns the asset into a certain protocol or anything like that. It's just kind of a degree of separation. I would say anything that separates um, your assets, like fragmentizes your assets between different wallets or different paradigms is important. Um, personally, um, when it comes to my own crypto security, I have my assets split between many different wallets. Um, I have my own security system there. Uh, when it comes to your personal security, I would just recommend having a threshold. I don't know what's comfortable for you. Maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's 50,000, but whatever you're comfortable to lose on each wallet, which is hopefully zero, but um, as long as you're not losing your entire balance for making one mistake, um, I support anything of that kind of type. So I love delegates. I love Delegate Cash, who's kind of the lead of that, um, who's kind of leading that initiative. Um, and I, I hope to see more of them, to be honest with you. So the question was, how do you, how do, I, I guess, how do we protect, like, as a company or just in general? Okay, cool. So the question is, how do companies defend against like supply chain issues like Ledger's Connect Kit and stuff like that? Um, and the truth is that there's, when it comes to like hardware wallets, that's a big trust factor when you're using them uh, because there's nowhere really, there's nowhere else really in the whole like crypto supply chain except you know hardware wallets and the portals that you use. Also like software wallets like MetaMask. Um, you know, I would say. It's a tough question because those are like the most dangerous attacks. And at, for like a hacker team, it, it's super profitable. The, the prospect of hacking MetaMask or the prospect of hacking Ledger, like ConnectKit, um, is, is a super profitable idea. And it's something that's going to happen. Um, and my recommendation there is I hope nothing like that ever happens because it's going to be bad for, I would say, a majority of crypto users. Um, or any, I don't think the ConnectKit issue was at the scale of like, apocalyptic levels, but if there is ever a threat like that, I would just make sure that your assets are separated across multiple wallets. Do, do you mind if I come over there? Uh, I, I can't hear you too well. Awesome, okay. So last question, the, the, the question is, you know, I talked about hardware wallets and how we're supposed, to, like how it's important to have one, but I didn't talk about where we're storing the recovery keys. So for context, that's like the paper and pencil where you store your seed phrase. Uh, honestly, there's not really many good ways to do so. Like I've seen people engrave it on metal so it doesn't like burn if your house burns down. Um, I, I, I think the best way and the most used way is writing it down on a piece of paper and storing it um, in, in a place that only you know about. Uh, I wouldn't actually store your seed phrases in a bank security deposit box because it's, it's actually dangerous. People get hacked that way. So 
I would say storing it in a place that only you know. Maybe that's digging a hole. Maybe that's in a cabinet. But um, just put it on paper and never digitally. Uh, and that was the last question. So uh, sorry about that. You can meet me over there, and we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thanks so much, and have a good one. that. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Good? Good? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So we're going to move on to our uh, first panel of the day. We're going to move on to our first panel of the day. There we go. Uh, this is uh, ETH Denver 2024. Hashtag ETH Denver 2024. <laughs> Please uh, post on socials um, anything that you like. Uh, Remember, there are two main venues here. Uh, there's, this is the Sport Castle. We also have the Biddle Hub. There are three stages in each. There are speakers from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. So there's a lot.